In continuation of our COVID-19 response, we are sharing another full seminar. You can support our ongoing efforts to provide free and low-cost educational resources during this pandemic by making a donation on our website or a purchase in our audio and video store. We have extended our Stay Connected sale through May 31st, so you can still get 40% off everything in our store by using the coupon code CONNECT on the cart page before checkout. Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast, Analytical Psychology Seminars from the Archives of the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. They had a dream, we have a dream. C.G. Jung, Martin Luther King Jr., and the Evocative Power of Symbols, with Jennifer Lee Selig, Ph.D. Jung initially rejected the invitation to write Man and His Symbols, whose intention was to make Jungian psychology understandable to a general audience, but a dream convinced him otherwise. In his dream, he speaks to a multitude of enthralled people who understand everything he says. In this presentation on Chapter 1 of Man and His Symbols, Approaching the Unconscious, we'll explore how two years after Jung completed both his chapter and his life, Martin Luther King Jr. spoke to a multitude of enthralled people and translated many Jungian concepts into everyday language in his I Have a Dream speech. Jung's chapter is concerned with four major areas, the unconscious, dreams, archetypes, and symbols, all four of which we find illustrated and translated to a general audience in King's dream speech. We'll dream the dream forward into the 2020 election and see how leading presidential candidates are working with archetypes and symbols as well on behalf of the psychological health of the body politic. The seminar was recorded on October 4th, 2019, so comments on the presidential elections will be made from that point of reference. The PowerPoint shown during the seminar is available through a link in the show notes and includes links to the videos that were played during the seminar on YouTube. Jennifer Lee Selig, PhD, is the founder and former chair of the Jungian Archetypal Studies doctoral degree at Pacifica Graduate Institute. She has spent almost two decades researching, writing about, and presenting on Martin Luther King Jr., including her 2005 title, Integration, The Psychology and Mythology of Martin Luther King Jr. and His Unfinished Therapy, with the Soul of America. Her latest books include Everyday Reverence, A Hundred Ways to Kneel, Kiss the Ground, and a co-authored volume titled Deep Creativity, Seven Ways to Spark Your Creative Spirit. More information is available at jenniferleeselig.com. Thank you so much for being here. It's um, such an honor to be able to speak in Chicago. Um, And particularly thanks to Victoria Drake and the program committee for making that invitation happen. Um, One of my mentors is Richard Tarnas, a great philosopher and cosmologist. And he, he talked about the way to get a good piece of writing and research done is to sign up to speak. Because you, you get an invitation, and all you have to do is put together like a little paragraph, and you send it off, and you forget about it for a while, and then you have to produce something. And um, that has really worked for me for this talk. I've had so much fun in the last couple of weeks putting this together. I've learned a lot. I'm really excited to share this material with you. Um, I'm also excited that we're doing this material in Chicago, since this city was so important in the civil rights movement, and... Um, the brief time that Martin Luther King lived here in 1966 
was um, really so important to him and, and um, pivotal to his thinking about economic injustice and inequality and the connection with racial inequality. Um, and then I, a little bit later, I'm going to talk about a Barack Obama, which, of course, you know the connection there. So this is a really sweet place for, for, for me to be giving this, this talk for the first time. So I wanted to start with just a little orientation to who I am and how I came to this topic of bringing Jungian psychology into dialogue with Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights movement. I was a high school teacher for the first 16 years of my career, and I was burnt out on the reforms that came in um, during the No Child Left Behind era, which took away all the courses that I was teaching and um, kind of dried up my soul and my passion for teaching. So I began to look for a way out, and that way out was to go um, get a PhD and move into teaching at the college level. And I began to look at different um, programs, and I synchronistically ran um, into Parabola Journal at that time. You know, Parabola Pacifica used to advertise in the back of Parabola all the time. And so I found an advertisement for Pacifica. I thought I was teaching a myth a course um, up until that time, and I thought I wanted to go into the myth program at Pacifica um, because I had been studying Joseph Campbell quite a bit. But when I got the catalog and I read about the deaf psychology program, I was really intrigued, and I thought, I, I don't know what this is, but I really want, I want this. And that myth led me to deaf psychology, and Joseph Campbell led me to the work of Carl Jung. So I, I came at it from him. So that's that area of interest. <clears throat> but I've always also been interested in the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King Jr., even though I had no firsthand um, experience of either being born and raised in a sleepy agricultural town in Northern California in 1964. However, I did the math at one time, and I figured out that I was conceived right about the time of the March on Washington. I go back nine months and two weeks before the March on Washington, uh, or after the March on Washington. So my joke then became that um, in trying to explain my interest in King, that while he was declaring, I have a dream, on the East Coast, I was conceived on the West Coast, brought into this world with something at stake in helping to further that dream. Um, in January of 2001, I was contemplating dissertation topics one weekend. It was at the end of my, almost at the end of my coursework at Pacifica. And it was King's birthday, and I did what I did every year on his birthday, which was to take down a book of his um, speeches and sermons to read. And that year, I pulled down uh, this book, Strength to Love, and I started reading it. And in one of his sermons, he mentioned Freud, which intrigued me. Um, and by the way, I can make these, this PowerPoint available to you by PDF. I'll get your emails if you're interested, because be, there's going to be a lot of quotes on here, so I don't have to say quote, end quote, all the time. So it's, gonna, it's a long PowerPoint, so feel free to give me your email, and I'll send it to you. So he mentioned Freud, and then in another essay, he mentioned um, the psychologist Eric Fromm. And then I kept reading, and then I um, saw that he had mentioned Karen Hornay, and he mentioned Alfred Adler. And so I got really curious. These were all people I had been studying at Pacifica. So I got curious about how much depth psychology King studied himself. And I was also curious how much it might have influenced or affected his thinking, and also, how might he have used depth psychological principles and practices to affect change during the civil rights movement? And in those questions, my dissertation topic was born. Um, this is, uh, Lynn mentioned the name, this is the book uh, based on my, on my dissertation work. I did bring some copies if anyone's interested in looking at one. So this brought together my interest in Jung and my interest in King into one place. So when I was trying to answer my questions and researching King's exposure to depth psychology, I, I turned to look at his college transcripts to see what he might have studied. Um, he was a sociology major, and he took his first college psychology course in the 1945-1946 year, school year, during his second year at Morehouse College. Uh, and that was a course called General Psychology, for which he received a grade of a C. The following semester, he took a course called Educational Psychology from the same professor and received the same grade. In 1946, 1947, he took a course in Social Psychology, and he got a B in that one, so he was improving. 
to his credit, he went to college at about 15 years old, 16 years old. He skipped some grades, so we can, we can give him a, a pass on those Cs. He also took other courses in sociology and philosophy where he might have also bumped into psychological thinkers. So perhaps the most interesting reference to depth psychology from that time comes from a paper King wrote for George Davis's class on the religious development of personality. And there King reviewed a book called Personality, Its Study and Hygiene by Winifred, Winifred V. Richmond. Is that name familiar to anyone? You heard it? I, I, he's, I can't even find the book online. It, it was popular at that time then, yeah. So um, he, in this essay that he wrote, he said the greatest impression that the book made on him, uh, the deeper insight it gave me into the psychological theories that I, I heretofore scorned, and he said, in particular, this was the first time that I was able to read the psychologies of Freud and John Watson with a degree of objectivity. I had read Joshua Lieben's Peace of Mind, and even he was unable to convince me that there was any truth in Freud. But now I am convinced. It is probably true that the basic facts of Freud and Watson are correct, notwithstanding the fact that their bias had conditioned what they observed. I am now willing to admit that they discovered new continents and new areas that had for centuries been overlooked. No one can observe human personality objectively without admitting the truth of many Freudian and Watsonian theories. So then, even more interesting, he goes on to write, Jung and Adler were given quite a bit of attention in Richmond's book, but it so happens that I've always had certain predilections for their theories over those of Freud and Watson. He ends by raising some questions about the possibility of psychology as an objective science, um, given that there were at least four schools of modern psychology at that time. And even within those schools, there were differences. And he says, for instance, Adler, Jung, and Freud have totally different approaches to psychoanalysis, albeit they are within the same school. May we not conclude that we have a long way to go in this whole area of the psychological analysis of personality development. So that was a thrill for me to find that paper. That was the first reference that I found to Jung, his exposure to Jungian psychology. And to see that not only did, did King study psychology, but he studied it enough in depth to offer some elementary criticism of it. Uh, A number of years ago, I was able to meet one of King's uh, classmates at at, at Morehouse who's still living, and I asked him about King's exposure to Jung because I couldn't find, I couldn't track anything else down. And he mentioned a professor there that had a certain predilection for Jungian psychology that they both had and studied under. He couldn't remember the name of that professor, but um, it it was an informal study as well as a formal study, so they got together and studied Jung's theories. So it's clear that Jung was exposed to and maintained a preference for Jungian psychology in his late, late teenage years. This is when, when he was studying at Morehouse, um, since he went to college so early. And those, you know, obviously very impressionable years. If any of us, were any of you exposed to Jung in your late teens, early 20s? Remember what a revelation that was? You know, um, So my dissertation writing and my subsequent research on King has explored what I call cultural therapy or how Jungian ideas can be applied to social healing and transformation using King and the civil rights movement as my case study. So in this way, I might be said to be practicing a depth psychology of extroversion. And I take this term from James Hillen in his book, We've Had 100 Years of Psychotherapy and the World's Getting Worse. When he wrote, what I am reaching for is shifting the idea of depth from the psychology of the inner person to the psychology of things, a depth psychology of extroversion. Now, if you know James Hillman's work, you know he was a renegade. That's what he actually called himself. This is a book I edited and published, a tribute to James Hillman, Reflections on a Renegade Psychologist. He said he didn't want to be known as the founder of archetypal psychology, but he wanted just to be known as a renegade psychologist. He was always picking the coin off the ground and turning it around to look at the other side. So he argued, Jungian psychology in itself is a depth psychology of introversion, where we take the world in to ourselves as an object, um, and we take what happens in our dream life and our waking life, and we look at what it says about me or my situation, what it offers me, and what it represents or symbolizes to me. A depth psychology of extroversion then does the opposite. It takes something out in the world and extends the self out 
to enjoin with it. In other words, when something happens to us, like an encounter with another, it is an act of introversion to draw it in, to get curious about it, what it means about me or, or my situation or myself. And it is an act of extroversion to be drawn out into the encounter, to get curious about its own meaning, to join it rather than enjoin it to us. So that's how Hillman is using that term. So when I was researching this idea of cultural therapy, what I was doing was to take the best principles and practices of Jungian psychology, which is a psychology of introversion, and I turned it outward to see how those principles and practices um, could become tools for acting therapeutically with a culture or a collective. Not just how do I use these principles and practices for my own individuation or that of my clients in the therapeutic encounter, but how can we use these principles and practices for cultural individuation, in this case with the country as our client? And King, I argued in my research, did just that. Now I want to add one more psychological function here to this discussion of introversion and extroversion. We know that uh, Jung typed himself as an introverted thinker. I'm not entirely comfortable typing King Um, even after 18 years of formally studying him, but I am comfortable saying that he functioned most effectively in the public and political uh, arena as an extroverted feeler. So I've been very moved by the work of Peter T. Dunlap, who's a psychotherapist and a political psychologist, who wrote about the importance of having leaders that are extroverted feelers. In his book, Awakening Our Faith in the Future, the advent of psychological liberalism. Um, He argues that we are learning to attend to our emotions for the sake of activating a new level of political energy and a new political identity. And by that, the we as leaders are learning to attend to our emotions for the sake of activating a new level of political energy and a new political identity. He calls this an emergent capacity and notes that through cultural leaders, these emergent capacities first appear and that they lead people to higher levels of evolution. And his term for this is affect freedom, which he defines as the capacity to experience and use a full range of emotion for the psychological, political, and moral needs of one's time. And he quotes the sociologist and psychologist Aftab Omer, um, saying that cultural leaders are able to transmute how they are personally affected by the culture into creative action that midwives the future. In Dunlap's own words, cultural leaders are able to use emotions to connect to and motivate a new constituency and a new social movement. There's a real preference for extroverted feeling over extroverted thinking, that it's the extroverted feeling that's motivational rather than the extroverted thinking. And these cultural leaders are able to tap into the imagination of people, of the people, and activate images of the future that are commensurate with the crises we face and would provide the necessary glue that would allow us to bind ourselves to one another in a new level of moral and civic collaboration, which I think is a really important idea. So I'm going to read it one more time. That these leaders are able to tap into the imagination of the people and activate images of the future that are commensurate with the crises we face and would provide the necessary glue that would allow us to bind ourselves to one another in a new level of moral and civic collaboration. And when I read that again, you can hear where I'm going with King, as that's certainly something that King was able to do. So in summary, they do that through extroverted feeling, displaying their emotions and their values in the public arena, allowing their listeners and followers to do the same, allowing and encouraging their listeners and followers to do the same where their listeners and followers and constituents experience affect freedom and are able to use those affects in a creative way to affect social change. King did this brilliantly during the civil rights movement. And this is not to say that he used emotion over logic, that he utilized feeling over thinking. He was an intelligent man who used rational argument all the time. His famous letter from Birmingham jail is a rhetorical masterpiece of rational thinking. But it is to say that when he combined 
the rational and the emotional, his rhetoric soared and he reached a place of transcendence. In Jungian terms, we might say that out of the tension of opposites between the rational and the emotional, between thinking and feeling, he was able to to display the transcendent or activate or enact the transcendent function. And no place is that more clearly on display than in his I Have a Dream speech, which sometimes I refer to as my conception song. (laughs) But before we look closely at that text, I want to turn to the text that animates the speaker series. I'm first in a a four-part speaker series on the book Jung's, Jung's book, Man and His Symbols. And I was asked to speak on chapter one, Approaching the Unconscious. But before I get to that chapter, I want to talk about the introduction to the book by John Freeman. Some of you will um, be familiar with this video I'm going to show you a little bit of from 1959, where the British Broadcasting Corporation sent uh, John Freeman to interview Jung. So I'm just going to play a little bit of this interview. This is on YouTube. They steal my things, even my hat, he says. We like that. I like seeing that side of him. So there was another man named Wolfgang uh, Fogas, I think. I don't know how to pronounce that. But he was a managing editor at a publishing company. And he saw this, this video. Um, and he contacted Freeman to elicit his help in convincing Jung to write a book that would be easy to read, since Jung's not so easy to read, um, <laughs> more for the general public. This is 1959. Uh, So Freeman went back to Zurich to meet with Jung, talked to him for two hours trying to convince him to write this book, at which time, at the end of which time, Jung said no. Um, And he gave two reasons for that. He said he was old and tired and didn't want any long-term commitments like this. And this is two years before his death, so he's he's sensing the long-term commitments not in the cards for him. And he also said he had never tried to popularize his work, and he wasn't sure he could do so now. 
But then Jung had a dream. Quoting from Freeman, this is the introduction to Man and His Symbols, he dreamed that instead of sitting in his study and talking to the great doctors and psychiatrists who used to call on him from all over the world, he was standing in a public place and addressing a multitude of people who were listening to him with rapt attention and understanding what he said. And Freeman italicizes that, understanding what he said. So we can assume that that was really the critical factor there. And we know from Jung's letters and publications that he's oftentimes talking about being misunderstood, that no one understands him. So this is an impo- it was important for him, obviously. You can see why that idea might even be healing for him at the end of his life, to be understood. So Jung, knowing he couldn't do the whole book, he chose four of his followers to write four chapters, and he wrote the first chapter. And he spent the last two years of his life doing that, and that chapter is what brings me here today. And I wanted to summarize this backstory because I'm building towards this argument that two years after Jung's death, it was Martin Luther King who stood in a public place, in this case in front of the Lincoln Memorial on the, March, on the, on the mall excuse me, in Washington, D.C., And he addressed a multitude of people. In this case, the estimates are a quarter of a million people who were there um, and then millions more who watched on television. And listening to him with rapt attention and understanding what he said. And though King never mentions Jung or names any Jungian concepts in that speech, we'll see shortly how Jungian informed King's speech really was. Indeed, I'm going to argue that the I Have a Dream speech which an organization named American Rhetoric has listed as the number one speech in the 20th century, Um, that it is the number one speech of the 20th century because it makes use of the four key ideas in Jung's chapter, which is the unconscious, dreams, archetypes, and symbols, coupled with a discussion of the importance of the feeling function, the extroverted feeling function. And we all know how much psychological power that we tap into when we work more consciously with these five areas, personally and therapeutically. But of course, as I suggested earlier, also culturally and politically. So we'll look at how King did it in 1963. But I want to bring this idea forward to 2019 and 2020. So we'll use some of our time together this afternoon in looking at how our current presidential candidates are tapping into those five Jungian superpowers, we could call them or not tapping into them to their benefit or detriment. Now, I'm aware that when Jung talks about dreams, he's referring to those visitations that come during sleep, where imagery from the unconscious presents itself to us. And that's what he's talking about in the book, primarily. So when King repeats, I have a dream, he's referring to a different kind of dream. But still, he is presenting imagery to us, this imagery from the dream of America, or the dream of of some Americans most or many Americans. And we can work with the imagery from the dream in the same way we can work with the imagery from a sleeping dream. Perhaps in my language earlier, we can call his dream an extroverted dream versus the more introverted ones we have in our sleep. In this way, his dream is our dream, one of the many dreams of America. And we can look at the imagery of the dream for its teleology, for what it's pointing us toward, for how America itself may be individuating, or the impulse of America to individuate. So we're going to listen to the, to the dream, but before we do, I want to give you just a little history about it. There's someone very influential behind the I Have a Dream speech, someone without whom we wouldn't have heard that I Have a Dream refrain on that sweltering August day in 1963, and that's the gospel singer Mahalia Jackson. Jackson first met King in 1956 at a National Baptist Convention, and she later agreed to sing at the Montgomery Bus Boycott Fundraiser. After that, she frequently went to rallies and fundraisers, even going with King into some of the more dangerous areas in the South in order to support him. I want to show you a really sweet video of the two of them together.
nothing I can say concerning this great gospel singer in our midst, our dear friend, my great friend Mahalia Jackson, that a voice like this comes only once in a millennium. <laughs> Concerning whether we have a movement here in Chicago, you ought to be in this church tonight. <laughs> Jay, I love that clip. Talk about extroverted feeling, right? <laughs> so they were compatriots in the movement, and he's obviously so pleased to be in her company. It's really sweet. Um, and they were friends as well. And on a more personal and private note, he used to call her on the phone when he was down and depressed and ask her to sing his favorite song, his favorite gospel song, which was Precious Lord, Take My Hand. And if, you see the, if you've seen the movie Selma, they re- recreate that scene in the movie where he calls her on the phone. And it's um, particularly poignant to bring that up because the very last words King spoke before he was assassinated on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel was to a singer, Ben Branch, who was down in the parking lot. Um, And he said, Ben, make sure you play Take My Hand, Precious Lord, in the meeting tonight. Play it real pretty. And then he was shot. And Mahalia Jackson sang it, that song at his funeral, and so did Aretha Franklin. You can see both of those clips on YouTube as well. So hold this connection between King and Jackson for a minute, because I want to come back to it. But let me talk about King's speech that day on the March on Washington. He knew he only had five minutes to give his speech, and he was torn between two metaphors. One metaphor is the metaphor of the bad check, saying that America had um, given black people a check for freedom that they had defaulted on. Or to use the dream metaphor, the dream of racial equality, racial equality. And he had actually given parts of that I have a dream speech before, so a couple times before. So he knew that went over well. And he thought he didn't have time to use both of the metaphors. So he settled on using the, the um, image of the bad check, thinking that it was a more low-key, he used the term low-key um, metaphor, and that it was appropriate for the March on Washington, given that it was going to be an integrated crowd. So he was delivering that, that um, speech on the bad check as planned up until a point. So I want to play you that, and then I'll, I'll stop it um, at the point in which he changes. Just that moment. And as we're, we're, we're listening to this, um, you know, if you... You can just listen for sure, but if you ju- if you want to jot down any images, symbols that you hear in the speech, because we'll be looking at those more closely after we move through this first part. Can, can, yeah. Um, also about Mahalia Jackson, one of the icon songs that's "You'll Never Walk Alone," and I remember when Barbara Streisand sang that the day that the 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 the, 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 Trump, the the Twin Towers fell. Uh, it was very powerful. It was, uh, it was, was all equated to Mahalia Jackson and that anthem and how uh, Barbara sang, symbolizing the moment that we were living. Yeah. Exactly that moment of the, the towers falling right. and how we all fell the moment and then we were just singing. I remember very powerfully that. And again, it's a Mahalia Jackson song. Beautiful. Which is, which is sung so many times. It's a gospel. Right. I don't know. And, and Barbara did it in such a beautiful way very powerful and, and representing, symbolizing where we were at that point. Yeah, yeah, and holding holding the feeling function the for feeling, the, right, yes. and allowing other people to feel um, through, this, through the yes. music. Yeah, mm-hmm. thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we'll listen to this, and then I'll tell you another bit of a story, and then we'll take a break and come back to the second part of the speech. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow
Vienna we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, The Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. So we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. Ever since we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check, when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They were signing a promissory note to whichever American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. <laughs> but we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great bulks of opportunity of this nation. So we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time <laughs> to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time <laughs> to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment, this sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 
slums and ghettos of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Okay, that's on script. It was everything he had written down to read at that point. And that's about 10 minutes. So he was already five minutes over his time limit, and I would assume coming to closure soon in his notes. Um, that last line, <clears throat> we just heard, the go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama. That line was supposed to be this line here. Go back to our communities as members of the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Dissatisfaction, <laughs> which is a mouthful, Right. And so the story goes, he, and this was a common theme for King to talk about creative dissatisfaction. Um, he, he actually criticized modern psychology, the psychology of the 50s and 60s, a lot. And he, he, he called on people instead to be create, always creatively, creatively maladjusted or creatively dissatisfied. And that creative in front meaning to take action, to be able to take action on your maladjustment and, and um, dissatisfaction. And this makes a lot of sense. He criticized modern psychology for having as its buzzword the word adjustment, a big word during that time. And he said, um, you know, these are the years when uh, doctors, medical doctors, first started to prescribe Valium for housewives, um, known as Mother's Little Helper, the Valiums, um, to, <laughs> to helping them become better adjusted to life at home with their children. Um, but King argued that there were certain things that we should always be maladjusted to, and including racism, inequality, and poverty. But the line was so clunky that he stopped himself from that line, and he said the next line instead. Naming the cities in the south, and then also the slums and ghettos of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. And it's at that moment when he delivers this line that um, Mahalia Jackson, who's right here, says, tell them about the dream, Martin. Tell them about the dream. So she'd obviously heard an iteration of that dream speech before and knew that it was called for in that moment. Um, King's advisor, Clarence Jones, was there on the stage as well, and he, he recalled that moment. He said, King looked over briefly at Jackson, and then he takes the text of the written speech that's been prepared, and he slides it to the left side of the podium, grabs the lectern, looks out on more than 250,000 people there assembled. And Jones remembered turning to the person next to him and said, these people out there, they don't know it, but they're about ready to go to church. <laughs> So you ready to go to church with him? So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream. One day, this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its dream. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created in
This is our hope. This is the thing that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day with all of God's children be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty and be I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrims cry. From every mountainside, let freedom reign and for Americans to be a great nation. This must become true. So let freedom reign. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom reign. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom reign from the hiking alligators of Pennsylvania. Let freedom reign from the snow-capped rapids of Colorado. Let freedom reign from the crevice of slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom reign from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom reign from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom reign from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom reign. And when it happens, when we allow freedom reign, when we let it reign from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. All extemporaneous. So Clarence Jones says, I've never seen him speak that the way I saw him on that day. It was as if some cosmic transcendental force came down and occupied his body. It was the same body, the same voice, but the voice had something I had never heard before. Jones called it the transformation from a lecturer to a preacher in that moment when he makes the shift into the dream. In that moment when he starts the I have a dream refrain, the speech becomes the speech. It becomes what we would call maybe a big dream or a numinous dream. And it certainly altered King's power and presence in the country. i play for you just a second of Clarence. Um, Joan saying this. The truth. The truth eventually comes out. I always remember it. Is that after the march, the number two person in the FBI, Carlo DeLoach, I believe, sends a memo to J. Edgar Hoover and to Robert Kennedy and said almost verbatim, but this is a paraphrase, that as a result of the March on Washington and Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, clearly Martin Luther King Jr. was the most powerful and most dangerous Negro in America, and he had to be stopped at all costs. Um, so I want to I want to move into looking at Jung's chapter then and go through looking at archetypes in the unconscious and dreams more specifically. But um, maybe we can take a break before we do that. Okay, a five ten minute bathroom break, coffee break, whatever, and we'll come back and look at look at Jung, bring Jung back again.
special ones. Um, before we go looking at Jung, though, and, and do kind of a close reading of that chapter, any comments or questions on what we've, where we've been so far? Please. <clears throat> it's very heartening to come here this afternoon and listen to you speak um, about this topic in particular. On my way here, as I was driving, I was listening to PEC, um, and Worldview was on with Jerome McDonald. And he had a professor from Northwestern University who was speaking about his research of how um, civilizations decline. And it, uh, the theme, the through line that he saw among, amongst, I think there were a few other researchers who saw the same thing, um, is that when uh, power is power and wealth is um, held in the hands of a few, that that is really the signal for the tipping point. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're addressing here today is does it really have to come to that? The, I mean, do we really have to keep, um, do civilizations have to keep crumbling for the chaos to, you know, reorganize uh, that state of affairs? And I think what's being suggested here is that it really has to do with consciousness. And I know that's what you was talking about, mm -hmm. but uh, Martin Luther King as well. And I think it's wonderful that Martin Luther King is being compared or partnered with Carl Jung uh, because the soul of America is so affected by the black experience. It is so shaped by it. It is so deepened by it. It is so tragically deepened by it but so beautifully deepened by it. And to have that uh, come to the surface, it's a painful uh, reaching. Um, uh, I think like earlier you said something about, you know, the America's individuating, mm -hmm. let's hope. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, it is through the pain of, of slaves, not just black slaves, although that's a major part of it, but all of the slaves that came to this country. Uh, under the domination of a few. And um, so if, if we can take this heart, um, you know, and really integrate it into our own lives mm -hmm. and, and make, make political change mm -hmm. from that level mm -hmm. rather than blowing something up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm, as I've been listening to this, I'm Thinking back to my years doing my master's in social work at the University of Chicago, and I'm frustrated that we studied none of King's work, including um, what was in Chicago. Wow. <laughs> and we studied nothing of Carl Jung. And it's, Which is uh, less surprising, truly, that you studied yes, less of Jung than you didn't study King. But it's, uh, it's, it's frustrating because there's so much to offer mm -hmm. in so many different angles, whether they're doing a neoliberal perspective, they're doing a research perspective, they're doing a sort of perspective, mm -hmm. you know, King's life and his work mm -hmm. uh, would greatly inform that. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're yeah. doing the city as well as the profession a great disservice by not including his work. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, I think so. I've said, you know, I've been with King since 2001 formally. Um, and I, I feel like there's no social issue that comes up that he does not have words of wisdom to, to bring to it and practices to bring to it. It's uh, this opus of, of work and the expanse of his work is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, it struck me that you, when you said that in this pivotal speech mm -hmm. that King went from a lecture to a preacher. Um, I know you were quoting something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because that's also been said of Jung that he really wanted to be more in the spiritual trip like path mm -hmm. and that the, the book of his uh, Job's response mm -hmm. his response to Job um, was one of his favorites because he just got to be unequivocally spiritual mm -hmm. and instead of having to be a uh, psychologist and philosopher and so I, I think it's I never really put together that pairing but that there has to be, like you said, the extroverted feeling, but it's also like the the, the spiritual aspect informed by the uh, academic, mm -hmm. by the intellect. Mm -hmm. um, 
would you say that that comment only would go together with some of the extrovert feeling in these public speakers? That 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 switch from intellect to kind of like more of a newness involves some sort of spirit, but there's also a certain amount of, of feeling or value that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. It's interesting. In in my book, I, I have a I talk about um, Jung's essay on therapists and the clergy, where he's really talking about how they sort of serve as the same function, of one inside of the church, obviously, and one outside of the church, but that but that they're they're very similar, and um, and I think Jung took the therapist and King took the clergy, but they're both doing very similar work of healing, and there's lots of. There's lots of speeches that King gave that are very psychological. Some of his early sermons before he really became the civil rights leader had to do with, he has a, I have a whole chapter on these psychological speeches. He talks about the inferiority complex. He talks about the superiority complex. He called it the drum major instinct. Um, he was an advice columnist for Ebony Magazine for a while. And, um, and I have a chapter also on the advice that he gave, kind of bringing Everything from is rock and roll evil to uh, homosexuality. He, I mean, he weighed in a lot of different things, extramarital affairs, etc. And his advice column that he did for a while. So there's a real overlap in those in those two functions. And it, and I, I hear it. I hear that shift in that speech where he's really going from. Uh, if you watch it in its entirety, where he's really going from thinking through this metaphor of the bad check to feeling through what is and what could be. Which is, you know, also a place that therapists hold for their clients, right? What is and what could be. So, you know, tremendous overlap. Please. Uh, thank you for your joke, by the way, the conception. Yeah. Of March, <laughs> and same thing with the, the soul and and burying deep and um, superficially with your pain. And um, I feel like the march is the pain, and then deeply you were in your room, you know, being conception and and, yeah. and it's a. Uh, it, the connections, I, I feel like, are pretty profound. Yeah. Um, so currently, I, I just wanted to share reading Messages from the Masters by Brian Weiss and um, uh, <laughs> connections, and I'm sorry, I'm very emotional all the time. But um, I just want to, do you mind if I share what I just read? Sure. Literally, like, ten minutes ago. So he said, I had a dream about compassion and cooperation in our communities. I could see the buildings and the people of an ideal village. And I felt their dedication to social responsibility, to helping their neighbors. This is what makes a real community, what can transform our communities into a paradise, the way this world was intended. When we forget or are unaware, then people seek power, wealth, celebrity status, or privilege, instead of compassion and cooperation. There exist hierarchies and the slavery of class differences. Um, so deeply, the slavery and civil rights, but mm-hmm. I think individuality with ourselves to <laughs> be prisoners to ourselves. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's my connection. To yes, beautiful. Self. Yeah, King called that the beloved community. It's kind of this utopian idea of community coming together. And in the beloved community, we would not have economic injustice. Or mm-hmm. have, you know, we would not have power over and We would not have hierarchies like that. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. right. It's a, it's a, and I'll, I want to, I'll get into the speech and talk about how he, how he levels the hierarchies in, inside of the speech itself. Last I do know that. I do like when you're talking about uh, 2020 because that's what drew me to come yeah. here to begin with. Because I think it's it's interesting when I I, I read I saw the interview about you, uh, Jan in, in 1959 and then also Martin Luther King. In our times now, I can see the correlation that it feels like almost like that that very fine uh, zone of dark and light because I feel like we're living very dark times and almost like it's gonna the light's gonna come back again, but it feels very, very, I mean, cyclically speaking. And so when I read that, I was like, yeah, I, I, I'm having that same feeling of wanting to something light because it, it feels very dark, feels very heavy. Yes. And when you see that I have a dream, just like when you read about Young talking about uh, 1959, how he was very discouraged because the world turned into nuclear, and it, it, it's, it's, there's a heaviness, there's a darkness looking for a light, and I think that that's, that's the parallel that I see we're living right now, mm-hmm. moving forward to 2020. Yeah, thank you. Well, I was hoping that whoever is listening to this from the future, that your future is brighter than now. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we, are in, in, we are in dark times. I mean, it was, even in, in the last couple of weeks, trying to think about the 2020 presidential election, given what's happened and the speed of which it's happening, 
uh, was difficult to kind of nail down what I wanted to say about that. And I'll get to that at the end, but I want to go through this uh, speech in Jung's work a little bit more. Um, so take you through some of the Jungian concepts, and we'll look at how they uh, appear in the speech. So Jung calls dreams more poetic than rational concepts, which is interesting even in looking at this, that the, the, the bad check is a rational concept, the bank of justice being bankrupt, et cetera. It's a rational concept, but this, when he moves into the dream, it moves, I mean, it's a poetic rational context, con, uh, concepts, but still the second, the, the second part of the speech is where the poetry is in the dream. And Jung says this is what dream language does. Its symbolism has so much psychic energy that we are forced to pay attention to it. If you watch the whole speech, you can see the audience at the March on Washington a, a little. Uh, it takes they're 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 a little. I mean, it's hot, it's hot, and they've been there for a long time. But they're they're a little restless until King kind of moves into the dream part, and then and then the applause starts more, and people are more animated by that. So Jung wrote that the purpose of dreams is to try to restore our psychological balance by producing dream material that reestablishes in a subtle way, the total psychic equilibrium. And he calls this the compensatory or the complementary role of dreams. And I, I, I see that in that moment where Mahalia Jackson, she's actually prompting this compensatory function. She's trying to restore, consciously or unconsciously, because King has taken us through in that first part of the speech, such a dark night of the soul. And when she says, has him move into the I have a dream part then he comes back up to these kind of glorious heights and we can imagine that as a way of restoring psychic equilibrium we could even imagine that you know her her prompting of that is a prompting of the unconscious or a prompting of the anima to to come back to this compensatory function when Jung talked about consciousness in that in that essay he wrote about how consciousness can keep only a few images in full clarity at one time and even this clarity fluctuates. But the forgotten ideas have not ceased to exist. They can be recalled, he says. He calls them subliminal, subliminal material which often intrude in our dreams. So part of what King is doing in this speech is he's bringing in forgotten ideas, ideas that have fallen be, um, below the threshold of our lived experience as a country. Um, I made you a copy of this speech this was on a website that went through and actually looked at his um, civic references and his religious references. Put them in color so we could kind of examine them. So what King does in terms of these forgotten ideas that I'm talking about, King immediately evokes in his speech um, these, these ideas, after greeting the crowd, he says, five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. So he's reminding us of that document. In the fourth paragraph, he takes us back to the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, reminding us of those documents. Later on in the speech, he's going to re return back to the Declaration of Independence when he reminds us we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And toward the end of the speech, he reminds us of the words from my country, tis of thee. And then the line from every mountaintop, let freedom ring. So what I'm, what I'm saying here, what King's doing here, is what Jung is calling for, is to bring into consciousness these kind of, not necessarily forgotten ideals, but the ideals that have fallen below the threshold of our lived experience as a country maybe uh, ideals that we would prefer to remain unconscious given um, uh, how we're not enacting them in the country. But here's an important movement or move because Jung writes, dreams can reflect not just on the past we've forgotten, but a future where sometimes, so, where something is on, on the point of breaking into consciousness. He writes that the unconscious is no mere depository of the past but is also full of germs of future psychic situation and ideas. Completely new thoughts and creative ideas can also present themselves from the unconscious. And he writes, the images and ideas that dreams contain express new thoughts that have never yet reached the threshold of consciousness. 
So this is what I'm imagining the second half of the, of the speech really does. The second half points to those germs of future psychic situations and ideas. Ideas like black children being judged by the content of their character. Um, ideas like Jews and Gentiles and Protestant and Catholics joining hands. And ideas like freedom ringing not only in the mountaintops of the north, but freedom ringing in the southern mountaintops in the country. So these are these new ideas he's bringing forth through his dream, these ideas into our national consciousness. Um, I'm talk, talk about symbols a little bit here, which Jung also explores in depth in that chapter. Um, Jung says that symbols uh, says of symbols that they have a wider unconscious aspect that is never precisely defined or fully explained. Nor can we hope to define or explain it. As the mind explores the symbol, it is led to ideas that lie behind, beyond the grasp of reason. And it's really interesting in this essay. Uh, Jung really criticizes reason. Um, he has a line. Our present lives are dominated by the goddess reason, which is our greatest and most tragic illusion. Again, arguing for this feeling function I'm arguing for. So Jung is talking about how symbols are never only rational or capable of being grasped fully by the reasoning mind. There's something irrational about symbols, indefinable, emotional, and capable of touching the unconscious and stirring the emotions. And King's dream, of course, is full of symbols. It's chock full of symbols. Um, In his essay, Jung talks about symbols that are individual and symbols that are collective in nature. The collective symbols, he writes, are chiefly religious uh, images. And King makes use of so many religious symbols and images in the speech, and those are also marked for you in the text. I put on on the last page of the text the website where I pulled this from, because if you pull this up from the website, you can hyperlink to all of those religious, uh, religious images and symbols, and it'll take you to the place in the Bible where that's a reference to. So you can see that using collective religious symbols. So those are the ones marked in blue. So I went through the speech, and I pulled out all of this, what I would say are the symbolic images um, and have them here for you. And it's amazing. Just give you a second to kind of take that in if you can see it clearly. Sometimes he brings in images that are not symbolic, like when he talks about how people having been um, fresh out of jail cells. I don't put the jail cells on here. It's an image, but it's not a symbol. It's actually true. People were in jail cells, so it's, it's literal and not um, emotional or irrational in the way that symbols are. Anything you notice about these symbols kind of as a collective? Did I did I plant you in the audience to say that? <laughs> We've never met, honestly. Yeah, that's what I wanted to look at is the nature images in particular. So I just bolded them for you. So in his essay, Jung writes about nature archetypes. He says nature archetypes seem to hold a collective spell. He says this of symbols, too, that cultural symbols or collective images retain original numinosity or spell that can evoke a deep emotional response in some individuals. Archetypes, he writes, are at the same time both images and emotions. But their numinosity is and remains a fact and represents the value of an archetypal event. This emotional value must be kept in mind and allowed for throughout the whole intellectual process of dream interpretation. He calls psychology the only science that has to take the factor of value, i.e. feeling, into account and give due consideration to feeling. 
So here, King again offers credence to Jung's theory, using so many nature archetypes to really evoke a certain spell on the audience. So if we go back and look at the, the look at the speech as a dream at large, Jung calls dreams a specific expression of the unconscious. And in this case, because I'm calling this an extroverted dream, I would say it's a specific expression of the unconscious of the culture, the collective. And Jung talks in his essay about not straying too far from the dream with our personal associations. He gets in a little dig at Freud for doing that in, in, in his last work here. Um, but instead tells us that his method is, let's get back to the dream. What does the dream say? So there's something that King's dream is saying. There's something, some way that he's moving the country teleological t- forward toward individuation. Um, so if you were to listen to this as a dream of a client, those of you who are anal- analysts or therapists, like, what is the dream expressing? What's the dream wanting to go, you know, that making a move toward? Mm-hmm. I'm not an analyst at all, mm-hmm. but the unity of opposites keeps on cropping up. You've got island and vast ocean, sunrise and night, corner, homeland, um, valley, mountain, quicksand, walk, end, beginning, rest, whirlwind, and they keep on repeating, and it's like you go one way, then you go the other. This guy's got, he's, he's also was a plant in the audience. <laughs> From a lonely island of poverty versus vast ocean of material prosperity to be an exile in one's own land, promissory note versus bad check, rightful place versus wrongful deeds, physical violence versus creative protest, degenerate versus elevate, march ahead versus turn back, Negro in Mississippi versus Negro in New York, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, that should say Georgia, Louisiana versus the slums and ghettos of northern cities. Sons of former slaves versus sons of former slave owners. New Hampshire, New York, Pennsylvania, Colorado, California, all northern states to Georgia, Tennessee, Mississippi. Jews versus Gentiles, Protestants versus Catholics, black men versus white men. So lots and lots of contrast, right? Lots of oppositions. But then you also said it's expressing a unity in opposition? Yeah. Yeah. So... um, Jung said that symbols are the natural attempts to reconcile and unite opposites within the psyche. So King also does that. He calls up the oppositions in order to unite them into unity. So the archetype of unity here, black men and white men promised by the founding documents, both were promised by founding documents, he said. For all God's children, he repeats twice. Their destiny is tied up with our destiny. Their freedom is bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. My dream or our dream is the American dream. Sons of former slaves and sons of former slave owners together at the table of brotherhood. Little black boys and girls joining hands with little white boys and girls as sisters and brothers. All flesh shall see it together. We will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together. And then the last line, the black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics holding hands and singing free at last. So again, he's using all of these images and symbols as natural attempts to reconcile and unite opposites within the cultural psyche. I also think we can see in here, you know, Jung talks about archetypes in that chapter as well. I also think we can see um, the archetype of transformation is present in the, in the dream from one thing to another. Flames of withering injustice to great beacon of light, long night of captivity to joyous daybreak, dark and desolate valley of segregation to sunlit path of racial injustice. Yeah, it's image after image after image, right? He's not just saying we want to, we want to transform the culture. Quicksands of racial injustice to solid rock of brotherhood, sweltering summer of discontent, to invigorating autumn of freedom and equality, not an end but a beginning, whirlwinds of revolt to bright day of justice, sweltering heat of injustice and oppression to oasis of freedom and justice, color of skin to content of character, valley exalted, 
hill and mountain made low. That's that hierarchy I was talking about. There's a lot of, you know, the you know the valley will come up, the hill will be made low, rough places will be made plain, crooked places made straight. From a mountain of despair to a stone of hope, and the jangling discords of nation. Is that correct? Is that the word he used? It doesn't seem right. Oh, the jangling discords of the nation to a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. So lots of transfer, the archetype of transformation in here as well. And I skipped over this slide for a second, but this gets back to these opposites. Jung said, the sad truth is that man's real life consists of a complex of inexorable opposites. Day and night, birth and death, happiness and misery, good and evil. We are not even sure that one will prevail against the other, that good will overcome evil or joy defeat pain. Life is a battleground. Which King certainly doesn't leave us there. He gives us battleground imagery, but he doesn't leave us there. He takes us uh, into a transcendent place where good does overcome evil and joy does defeat pain. But that's also the preacher on on Martin Luther King, right? The preacher when he brings to that a spiritual place. Wouldn't you say that? Where I don't think Young totally goes there, I mean, directly. He may go directly in some level, but I mean, not directly, like, Mm -hmm. right? King does. Yeah, and, they, and it may be because they have different goals. I mean, certainly King's goal in this speech is to inspire. inspire. Right. And his goal is, 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 to, is to, through his extroverted feeling, to uh, evoke that in other people so that they will be so moved to go out and help work on behalf of the beloved community. So I think their, their goals are different in that sense. What I'm seeing also, especially in the, the previous list of the contrast, is the movement that... Um, Hillman and John Keats talk about moving between the veil and the peak, and moving, moving the movement between the experience of soul and the experience of spirit, mm-hmm. and then the tension between the two mm-hmm. and the interplay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, nice. Please. Uh, the mall is sort of the sacred space of America, like a church, mm-hmm. and uh, he's a pastor. Mm-hmm. And you've got the dome, the mother of the Washington Memorial, which is mm-hmm. totally masculine. Mm-hmm. And you've got the martyred son in Lincoln, who's looking down on him. Mm-hmm. And then you quoted someone saying that you know he'd never seen Martin speak that way. Yeah. That he was inspired. And you, you were sort of in the sacred land of archetypes, both in yes. the speech and what he's surrounded by. Right. How important do you think spatial relationships are to getting that inspiration? Oh, it's a great question. And I'm sure it was inspiration for him to, to, to be at that place. But I think it's more Mahalia Jackson than the place. I don't, he did not push his, his notes off to the left because he saw the Washington uh, Memorial in front of him. Um, it was Mahalia Jackson who called that forth. And the, the speech is rather subdued up until then. There's moments where he moves into feeling, but it's rather subdued up until then. So I think it was the eruption of, we could call the eruption of the feminine, the eruption of the anima, the eruption of the transcendent function being evoked, all sorts of ways we could use to describe that. But I wouldn't discount what you're saying at all, but I think in that moment she, she is the inspiration for that. Perhaps what also emboldened it was the space, as you're saying, being like uh, a holding environment or the ritual space for it, which then allowed Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And King oftentimes fed off the energy of crowds, uh, so it may also be that, that he was noticing that the energy of the crowd was not what he had hoped for. It was not giving this inspiring speech that he wanted to give, so he moved into that. Um, I also think it's almost a moment of archetypal possession. You can think about being possessed by the archetype of, of, of uh, transcendent, transcendence and, and unity and transformation, for sure. So I want to... I want to take all this because I think this is incredibly instructive um, wisdom that we could, <laughs> if, if, if our current slate of presidential candidates came to us for wisdom as Jungians or people who are interested in Jung, what we could, what we could tell them 
about evoking the imagination would have to do with evoking the feeling function, using more images, using more archetypes, um, not being so heady, policy there. And I wanted to play, before we kind of look at, look at the, that kind of motley crew, I wanted to play um, part of the Obama speech in 2004, the speech that brought Obama onto the national stage and made Obama Obama, the speech without which I don't know if he would actually be president. And you'll hear now, having gone through this, you'll hear all sorts of echoes of what we've been doing. Mm. Alongside our famous individualism, there's another ingredient in the American side, a belief that we're all connected as one people. If there's a child on the south side of Chicago who can't read, that matters to me even if it's not my child. If there's a senior citizen somewhere who can't pay for their prescription drugs and have to choose between medicine and the rent, that makes my life poorer even if it's not my grandparent. If there's an Arab American family being rounded up without benefit of an attorney or due process, that threatens my civil liberties.
I believe we can provide jobs to the jobless, homes to the homeless, and reclaim young people in cities across America from violence and despair. I believe that we have a righteous wind in our backs, and that as we stand on the crossroads of history, we can make the right choices and meet the challenges that face us. America, tonight, if you feel the same energy that I do, if you feel the same urgency that I do, if you feel the same passion that I do, if you feel the same hopefulness that I do, if we do what we must do, then I have no doubt that all across the country, from Florida to Oregon, from Washington to Maine, the people will rise up in November and John Kerry will be sworn in as president and John Edwards will be sworn in as vice president and this country will reclaim its promise and out of this long political darkness, a brighter day will come. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. Thank you. Okay, you got one part wrong. <laughs> so what do you hear in the speech? Again, that invoking of opposites and creating a unity. Yep. And, and he does it with his, even with his hands. He evokes the opposites. He, yeah. References to nature. Unity, connections. Mm-hmm. Archetype of unity. Well, it's also fascinating when you talk so much about hope. Like, that's the main symbol which he's evoking, you know, the energy he's evoking. Mm-hmm. And that that was part of the, the speech, was moving from the jangling discord of the nation to uh-huh. the stone of hope. To the stone of hope. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I think you used um, everyday examples in, in those opposites, right? We coach baseball here, and we yeah. see you know, homosexuals here. Yeah. It's just stuff we encounter every day. Yeah, yeah. This is particularly brilliant. I love that part, how he does that, the red states and the blue states, and showing that we're not that far apart in those states with those examples. What about Cain's Mm-hmm. Same as King, the, the pastor. Da 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 da. Mm-hmm. He turns at the same time. Mm-hmm. So he's like to ziver, delivering an answer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's that po- there's a the, that sense of poetry and that but that force, right? That energetic force that's carrying that extroverted feeling function. Like feel this with me, right? This is my hope. This is our hope. I'm. This is almost like I'm delivering it to you. And you can see the crowd just goes nuts. This crowd just goes nuts. Do you remember seeing anyone see the speech live when he first gave it? Some of you. I mean, I, 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 I was I, like, my knees went weak. I collapsed on my couch and I wept. It, it was completely autonomous. It was just like, oh my god, what was that? Right. Watching it alone, I couldn't believe it. I stood up and clapped. <laughs> <laughs> it overtook you like that. You stood up and clapped. I collapsed. And I clapped. What was that? Who was that? Right? And that's the, in the same way that, that, that the, uh, the I Have a Dream speech is the moment when King becomes really King, capital K, King. Um, Obama becomes Obama in that speech, right? And delivering that for us. He becomes, I mean, I don't know if he would have won the election without having galvanized everyone in 2004 like this, whether he would be president by 2008. Yeah. What do you think that touches in the human psyche? When you have, um, when all of these elements come together, um, what is it that gets stirred, do you think, in the human spirit or in the psyche? That's a good question. I mean, let's open that up and say, what, what, what do you, what's stirred? Because I'm arguing that the mechanism of the stirring is touching the archetypal touching the unconscious, touching the nature archetypes that really live inside of us as, as, as natural human beings. So but what else, what's getting stirred? I, I think it goes back to what I said before about the dark and light. Because um, when I hear, when I hear the, the, his speech and, and, and King, I, I immediately think about where we are right now and the kind of speeches we hear. And mm-hmm. I, 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 I can't help but just thinking about what Jung used to talk about the shadow, what is dark, and what is not dark, and, and how do we navigate those two? Because, I mean, we we cannot navigate hope without looking at the shadow, mm-hmm. without looking at the darkness. Mm-hmm. You know, that part that we, we want to avoid it, but it's there. Mm-hmm. And I think right now we're right in the shadow. And mm-hmm. so I, I, I you know, it, it's, a, it's a natural tendency. Even in my clinical experience as a therapist, 
uh, I, I hear my, my clients wanting to avoid the shadow, those parts that are, are very unpleasant and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And when I tap into them, some are receptive, some are very defensive. Mm -hmm. But slowly, I feel like we have to go there. We have to go and see what this is all about. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it speaks about that. So when I see that, I was like, wow, uh, how, how, how enlightening that is in, com in comparison to hear about the speech, the, the, the impeachment inquiries and all that, and all the negativity that goes with it, all the darkness. So I think it yeah, mm -hmm. speaks a lot about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think... Um, um, neither King nor Obama ignored shadow. And I just played you a, a part of the speech, but they don't ignore shadow. But yep. what they do is they show us how to how to, how to rise up, rise above, above it. Right. right, right. So it's it's a very it's based in reality. It's this kind of poly, he talks about that. It's not this it's not this unrealistic kind of hope. He actually defines the kind of hope he's using. It's yeah. not like a Pollyanna kind of hope. It's a specific kind of. Or hope even when you hear Mahalia Jackson, it's all. All the, the songs of hope is all based on from that dark place that you need to go above mm -hmm. and beyond. Even in, in like I was saying, you'll never walk alone. It's from a very dark moment that you have to go above and, 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 and you know mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. overcome yeah. that. Yes, it's this way of taking what's dark and heavy and deep inside and elevating it, bringing elevating it up, it. right? Bringing it up to the spirits. Yes. And there's something that, that, that evokes in us when that happens. What is it? I think it taps into our basic need to belong. He talks about the fundamental belief that I am my brother's keeper, I am my sister's mm -hmm. keeper. And what we know about Obama's family was that not everybody did belong. Mm -hmm. He didn't get to be with his father very often at all. Mm -hmm. He then had a second family, a stepsister. So not only for him, but for many, many people, family is not exactly cohesive, but it is our basic desire. It's a need. Mm -hmm. So along with that song, Never Walking Alone, it's a lot about belonging. Mm -hmm. And where do you belong? If you don't belong in your family, especially, then where do you belong in the American family? And yeah. And I, I write, I have an essay on, the, it's called The Content of Their Complexes, where I look at Obama and King and what their psychological complexes are and how they use those complexes to work with the country. And with Obama, I talk about that, but the, 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 he, he was a divided self. Right. The black father and a white mother literally was divided. He was called Barry when he was younger and then chose Barack. And there was a division in, in which side of your identity are you going to choose. And um, from that sensitivity of having to integrate his own opposites inside of himself, he was able to really speak with that kind of moral authority about integrating the country. And that, 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 that there was a, a certain power in the lived experience that he had, for sure. Thank you. Kyle, and then we'll go back. From, from what everybody is saying, I think, I think we are catching on to it. I mean, it's... It's, it's like the combination of um, combining these complementary opposites, um, the cadence, the um, appeal to the goodness mm -hmm. of, of people, mm -hmm. uh, open something up. And from those two disparate, um, the ways in which they're dealing with complementary opposites, that is, you know, when that joins together, and you said earlier, which I found really helpful, is that the bridge really is, is a symbol, to use a symbol. Mm -hmm. It brings them together. And when it comes together in a symbol, because they're obviously uh, emotionally building the, the psychic heat in the audience, right? Right. Um, so when it gets to that point, you have the transcendent function in the audience. That's masterful. Oh, yeah. Right. And I think, I think part of why, why he works this so well is he's so sincere. Right, because you can write a speech for someone and you can put all these things I'm arguing inside of that speech and someone delivers it without sincerity or without really, really feeling it and it's not going to land that way. You're talking about, right? I'm talking about... Which one you're talking oh. about? They're so sincere. You're oh. saying both about yeah. the king. Yeah, yeah, both. both. You really feel, you really feel uh, King's investment when he starts with the dream and you, that the line about his poor children being judged by the content of the characters. Really, really feel the investment. And the sincerity. 
in a way that I think he was totally sincere in the first part of the speech too, but he's reading words a little bit in the first part of the speech. He's thinking in the first part of the, this is a good metaphor in the first part. The second part is pure, pure authentic feeling. Okay. Um, what I hear them both embodying is the sovereign archetype, but particularly the king, and in the unification of all the opposites. Mm-hmm. Yes. And if you, Obama being all, they're both both Obama and Trump are populists, and but Obama was playing out more of the empowerment end of populism, and in the unification, and Trump is playing out more of the shadow power side of it. Mm. Yeah, yes. A really great contrast would be to listen to when we won't. (laughs) (laughs) Listen to Trump's, um, his acceptance, his uh, uh, speech, inaugural inaugural speech, speech. his inaugural speech to to, to listen to that in comparison to what we hear here. And to, you could, if you want to listen to it, you you could just go through the text and look at it, though, but certainly. absolute contrast inside of the, of the way they're using that energy. Yeah, I wonder if we could also, because you were talking about moving out to the cultural level with this, um, like with Hillman's work, how there's that in within the shadow and light of American culture, there is there's the power side of it, uh, which is colonialism and all of the, the dark things that have happened. And then there's the constitutional side of the civil liberties and the uh, all people being created equal and that side. And that it's working with, that all of our leaders are working with these two tensions. Yeah. Yeah. The ideal and the real. Yeah. And Karen Hornay's work when she talks about the ideal self and the real self and the actual self in between. That's why I think I, I write about that in my book too, about that tension. Yeah. 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 Um, that you asked what was moved, and yeah. yes, it's, it's going into the shadow, and, and what's moved I see as being the soul, but more so in in these experiences is the collective shadow, mm-hmm. and then the collective soul being evoked and mm-hmm. moved forward. And what I was thinking is that we have maybe more on an unconscious as well as conscious access, we are constantly being um, influenced by the collective, Mm -hmm. that the soul is not just personal, that it's part of the collective. And so during like times that are these speeches and these movements that we're also experiencing our own relief of the collective shadow and moving into light, Mm -hmm. both like, oh my gosh, this is addressing that, as Mm -hmm. well as potentially actually uh, experientially feeling that yes, in, yeah. during these public speeches. Right, right. Because that's the job of the leader, the extroverted feeling leader, mm-hmm. is to is, is to feel with us and for <clears throat> us and move us into more of the, the light and the possibility of human spirit versus taking us back into the darkness, which you can also do with extroverted feeling. Well, yeah. and, and I had a... And this probably is just saying it a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. Recently, I was thinking about public figures, that really what they are is collective symbols, and symbols are always moving the conscious and unconscious energies. And um, and that's what I was saying. Like That's also what we're doing and experiencing while we're hearing these speeches. Yeah. yeah. One more comment, and then we'll take a I was going to say about Obama, he's way beyond American culture, because if you had gone around the world or traveled to especially like Europe. I go to Europe a lot. I have family there. People adored him. He was loved around the world. So what he reached was way beyond American culture. He was reaching something that was very deep mm-hmm. in uh, in the human nature as opposed mm-hmm. to cultural. Yeah, well King too. Because that I Have a Dream speech has been played all over the world as yeah. an inspiring anthem. Yeah. King was beloved all over the world as well. I mean, both of them really, yeah, way beyond the American culture. Because the archetype of unity and transformation is archetypal. It's not an American thing, right? But 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 because we have such stark contrasts here, we're such a good illustration of that. Yeah. Like Young. Because Young is also worldwide. Right, yeah. right. When you're touching on that particular level. Yeah. I want to take just another five minute break so I don't want to come back and talk about who's running now and what's going on with them. Okay. So another five minutes or so. Play one last video about the about Obama and I'll kind of wrap that up and then we'll 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 move forward.
But I think this is getting at a lot of what I've been talking about as well.
the hope of a young naval lieutenant bravely patrolling the Mekon Delta, the hope of a mill worker's son who dares to defy the odds, the hope of a skinny kid with a funny name who believes that America has a place for him too. at that convention, which was the best speech of the convention, better than John Kerry's, was electrifying. And without it, he wouldn't be president. I think sincerity means a lot. There are people who, when they speak, they speak the truth as they see it, and they're, they're very effective at doing that. I believe this country will reclaim its promise, and out of this long political darkness, a brighter day will come. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. spirit of the place calls forth an archetype like that or energy like that. So this is a convention, and he's shilling not himself necessarily, um, but it, you know it's for Kerry and Edwards, and he's there to inspire people to vote for the Democratic Party, which is a very different uh, role that he's in as president of the United States, right? So it's an interesting question: what would happen if he had maintained that sort of energy vitality? It, he didn't carry a lot of the feeling function forward in his presidency. There were moments of it, for sure. Maybe it was um, just fatigued. Could have absolutely been fatigued. Yeah. Absolutely been fatigued. And, 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 and his sense of being a statesman is something different than being this inspiring. Um, but yeah, there, there, there was some criticism of that, of, of him not bringing forward that more. And when there were national tragedies, yes. he did come up when there were natural tragedies sometimes and, and carry the feeling function. But not, not always. You remember saying? I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Do you have an example or can you think of a time when he did that? Uh, every time there was a mass shooting. Yeah. And he would come and he would speak. And yeah. he would speak to the wounds and to the, to the trauma of not only the victims, but the nation that had to watch it. Yeah, for the mass shootings. I thought he was always very good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think about um, maybe just five minutes or so thinking about Trump a little bit in terms of this, in terms of what images and symbols has Trump used to galvanize his base? If we assume that he did something... What images or symbols stand out to you that are going to be associated with him? Fire and fury. Fire and fury? And like no one's ever seen before? Mm -hmm. Anger. Definitely fear. Mm -hmm. Those are, the, those are the, the feelings, yeah, anger, fear. Um, but what, what images or symbols is he used? Walls and separation. Yeah, wall, right? <laughs> the wall. Conspiracy theories. Yeah. Stay on the wall for a second because the wall is super, super powerful. And he knows it's super powerful because he knows if he doesn't deliver on it, he's less likely to get elected. And I say that today because he might be impeached <laughs> by next week. But, <laughs> but, but thinking about this, but he's, he's so, he, he knows that that was a promise he needs to deliver but on. But also what the wall symbolized. Yeah, so we're talking about symbols. Because right. I think uh, it's interesting because both King and, and uh, Obama, they don't reinforce otherness as otherness as a very bad thing 
And Trump, he talks about otherness, otherness, and otherness, mm -hmm. always is a very negative thing. Mm -hmm. a let's use the word shadowy thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's exactly why the wall is so powerful in that sense. Otherness is no longer something of either or as inclusion, but as disintegration, as mm -hmm. breaking apart. You know? I appreciate that because it's like Obama and King are talking about usness, and Trump is like otherness. Otherness. Otherness, yes. right? There's a real contrast inside yes. of that. So division versus unity. Yep. Um, so the wall. So the wall is highly symbolic, of course, right? So what else is it symbolic of? You said, you said it was separation, separation uh -huh. otherness. Did you have a thought? Well, just you know, it's so me based. I mean, it's, you know, uh, uh, that's what you stand for is just me, me, me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. me. And for what? Yes, yeah. it's yeah. me. Yeah. Well, it, well, there's there's an aspect of a protecting us. There's an, an aspect of that, but it's protecting a group of us, not all of us, right? Mm -hmm. Please. He, back. He, talk, he projects a lot of imagery of ostentatious wealth, mm -hmm. which I think that's part of what he's protecting mm -hmm. for the us, whoever they are, mm -hmm. that small group. Ironically, ostentatious us, the rich, but the forgotten man, which he runs on, right? Like I'm, I'm your, I'm your voice. I'm your advocate. You coal miners, you poor people. So there is a contrast in that, right? What else were you gonna say, man? No, that just touched on what I was. Gonna, I was thinking yeah. of like you know the Appalachian miner uh -huh. or someone that you know is is being they lost their job because they're back in Mexico or something like that. You're you're forgotten. No one's listening to you. There's a Elite academia that's running everything, mm -hmm. and they're forgetting about you. Yeah, and I'm and I'm listening to which is which is aspirational because what is what is almost promising is you can rise like I rose, right? Mm -hmm. And self preservation uses guns and violence to connect to those uh, the, to, to the people that feel like they have to protect themselves from others. Mm -hmm. So it's but it's crossing all sorts of fields for a, a different types of people. Mm -hmm. And it's, it seems like that in that protectionism and isolationism, there's the small us, small you us, and the large you us. If we're not globalists, we don't care what's going on anywhere else, we just have to take care of small you us. He's also speaking to superiority mm -hmm. and the whole syndrome of what it meant. Mm -hmm. of it. When he was growing up in America, you were superior mm -hmm. if you were white. Mm -hmm. Um, if you were Protestant, etc., etc., etc. So I think he's he's addressing, especially because so many of his supporters are a little older in years. He's make America great again. Mm -hmm. It's not just white; it's make um, make the person feel superior mm -hmm. again. You know, mm -hmm. world's greatest country. I'm mm -hmm. good because what I'm trying to say is people sometimes take their self-worth from what group they belong mm -hmm. in. And uh, so if your group is superior to every other yes. group, then you can hold on to Yeah, he carries, like, he carries so like the second line superiority, thing. right? You yeah. inferior people who are feeling inferior because of them and what they're doing, right. come with me in my movement and we will be superior again and the country will be yeah, superior again, right? I right? think so it is it's the archetype of superiority, right. inferiority playing on that on that right. And right? it's interesting what you said about Obama being loved all over the world, because yeah. I was just in Italy recently and you feel how the uh, of Trump and where we are right now is creating this uh, detestable feeling worldwide. I, I never felt so much uh, hostility, very, very, very subtle from being an American than ever before. Mm -hmm. And 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 also, it's also very interesting. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the spirit of the place. Also, when I flew back home and I got here in Chicago, as I flew back from Rome to Chicago, I felt a heaviness in the air. And I'm like, what is this heaviness that I feel that, that, that I wasn't feeling overseas? And I think all of that has to do with the spirit of time that we're living mm -hmm. with Trump and mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah, I, when I go speak internationally, I almost always start with an apology. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. This is my apology to her. I'm sorry <laughs> for my president. <laughs> um, I was thinking about the the red hats as a um, like a helmet that is given out to the soldiers, the foot soldiers of the movement. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a symbol of uh, the working class, middle class, the everyday person. You know, 
know, our, our national pass <coughs> of the baseball cap, mm-hmm. and the slogan on there that it's it, that it's like the march, it's like the marching banner in a sense. So it has this very militaristic, uh, almost like an it's almost thing off identity politics too, mm-hmm. in a way. Mm-hmm. When I see that hat of "Make America Great Again," I just translate it into "Make Me Great Again." Mm-hmm. Right, that's the inferiority part, right? Make me great again. Which is a which is a beautiful impulse, really. I mean, and down underneath, people who are wanting to rise up from their circumstances. And there's something lovely about that, yeah. not to be questioned in that sense, but it's how it's being manipulated, yeah. in a sense, by someone who, you know, I don't think he really sincerely cares about the Appalachians. Yeah. yeah, but not in the sense, but not in the sense of alienating others. I mean, I think that that's my fear about the Make America Great Again, because mm-hmm. I hear the, the alienation, the otherness. I mean, I can only be great if somebody else is inferior than I am. That's, to me, that's yeah. the... I well, and what, what Kyle was pointing out, the red hat, the red hat, it's the color of the Republican Party, right? It's not It's not a unity color hat. Yeah, it's it's also anger, fire. Anger, fire, right? On but top of the head. the right. trickster comes through because the acronym MAGA rhymes with megalomaniac. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> megalomaniac. Clever. We're not just seeing this, though, in America. We're seeing this across the yeah. globe in first right. world countries. And what I, you know, Trump is really, um, I mean, in a lot of ways, he's a symptom. And until we really take a recognition of the division that creates the disease, that is the disease, mm-hmm. where you have, an ex- you know, a lot of disadvantaged people. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember watching a talk after Brexit happened, and he, and the speaker said, beware, especially in America, you're going to see this. And it was before Trump got elected. And he was right. And he said the biggest problem is that the vision already exists. Mm-hmm. And the rural people, where a lot of people who came out sure. to uh, elect Trump, um, they don't have a, a, a belonging anymore. I mean, there's a lot of fall away from religion. There's um, there's not really a sense of pride that happens in in. The area, a lot of the farming is becoming more industry versus family oriented. A lot of that's being bought up. Um, there is a there you go. There's been a big problem with brain drain in the rural areas for a long time, and there's not like a collective story of that being a place that you should move to because it's a place of pride. Mm-hmm. And and like within, and I don't know about the different countries' divisions, but there's these severe divisions, and that that Trump just takes advantage of that. And it's kind of like the American representation of that. But we see that, you know, in a lot of the first world countries that are going, uh, this is going down. And so, you know, understanding how that division, and he builds a wall, is like we don't have to deal with the division. Let's build a wall and make it all better. You know, we can cut off the shadow. <laughs> we, can, we can just divide the shadow. We don't have to deal with it anymore. Um, which is about as practical as building a wall. <laughs> and, and so really understanding that the unity of transformation is needed Globally, mm-hmm. like in each of these countries, you know, and you know, we impeach Trump, okay, you know, but that there has to be that understanding and healing of, of this being a symptom of this actual division. Right, yeah, I appreciate bringing it up as a populist movement across the globe, too. You can look at that archetypally as well. Please. Uh, yeah, with the Obama speech, he brings a lot of goodness to light, and you feel good and feel yeah. great, but I think people don't have enough hope and faith to to live that out sometimes, like they see the Trump side of things and the darkness of it, like you were saying. Um, and I agree with the traveling. I was in South Africa traveling when Obama was being, um, and, every, and people would clap for us. So no. They were in the United States, they would clap and say, go Obama, and cheer. And I was just like, oh my goodness, this is yes. amazing. And then um, travel to other countries and Trump, and yeah, you, don't, you feel like you don't almost apologize. But these issues were always there. There was always mm-hmm. segregation. There was always division. There was always an imaginary wall. My cousins have been their families thrown apart and had to be like taken mm-hmm. back and departed. And um, it was always there. So I feel like it's a blessing that Trump was uh, elected because you have to. He, I think, he woke up a lot of people. You have mm-hmm. to see the insanely awful evil um, that he evoked and. In order to um, make the people who say nothing at all to actually stand up and speak. Yeah, then you remind me of that Martin Luther King quote he used all the time. Where he said, "The arc of the universe is long, but mm-hmm. it bends towards justice." Mm-hmm. Right. So right now we have a king 
Right, and then do a course correction, and then towards justice. Yeah. One more comment, and I want to pull up some yeah. images of our current candidates. What I wanted to say was, we're look at the resistance. It did not start with the Democratic Party and the traditional politicians. The real resistance was the first thing was the women's m movement, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. international, mm -hmm. seven continents, including Antarctica. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing now? Gun legislation, nothing until the Parkland kids right. stood up, children mm -hmm. standing up. Now you see little Greta out of Sweden start, <laughs> who's starting to stir. So it's yeah. a very interesting what's happening mm -hmm. in the resistance. It's very different than we've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not mm -hmm. from any party. No, but it's coming from women. It's coming from children. It's coming from... From the least of these, right? Yeah. It's not coming from the political Democrats. Yeah, um, thank you for that. I want to pull, I just want to pull up, because I want to, I want to pull up some images here. Um, so here's what I did to kind of frame this part of the talk, is I went to the major candidates' websites and I looked at their merchandise they're selling, because merchandise has to do with symbolism and image, right? So this is, you can buy this poster, if you'd like. What is this? What is this? How? Oh, I mean, right? Yeah. Big hand. Huge hand. <laughs> Hysterical. Huge hand. It's force. Force, right? Yeah. Right. And then again, the imagery of going up, rising up. Yeah. It's interesting. Is, is this for Trump or against Trump? It's for Trump. Okay. He's selling it on his website. I seriously look at that and I think it's a joke against it's Trump. So oh, no. Like, no, you can have this commemorative poster. Um... <laughs> This I find interesting. I don't know if you know this, but he's um, selling straws on his website. Mm -hmm. I'm living oh my god! Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> you can you can buy like ten straws for twelve dollars. This is the Trump straw because of yeah, it's like ecology. this to the yeah, right ecology. to the green movement to ecology. Mm -hmm. oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> this is so so highly symbolic of oh, all the things that you could be selling on your website to sell something that is that is. Where did you find this? Just go to Trump's. Home, his website, his campaign website, so you can buy these freedom straws. You know, talk about a powerful image. And I notice a lot on his website the use of people of color. It's really interesting, who are who are who are in his merchandise, like this, build the wall. Mm -hmm. This is a decal you can buy. So this idea of the witch hunt is a really good image he's using, an evocative image. Um, and also, we didn't mention, but the drain the swamp, so important as an as a image, as a symbol. So Democrats being the swamp creatures. You get this decal, or you can get these water bottles. So I'm looking at Elizabeth Warren. So I'm thinking about her. So, so what I want to talk about is how are these candidates using the extroverted feeling function? How are they using archetypes, symbolism, and images? So with Elizabeth Warren, this is her, you know, her big slogan. She has a plan for that. It doesn't really evoke the imagination, right? It's a thinking function. And that's sort of the problem with Elizabeth Warren is that she evokes the thinking function. She's the, she's the matronly teacher. Okay. I love her. I would book her for that. I need yeah. a plan. You need a plan. I need a plan. Yeah, but she does it with so much emotion. She yeah. does, though. She yeah. carries it with emotion oh, when she yeah. speaks. Yes. She, she needs a new graphic artist. That's for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I like a blue. She's the only one in all the merchandise I found that is actually using the word dream. So this is from Elizabeth Warren, although you would never know it's from Elizabeth Warren if you look at it. I mean, it might say that right here. Dream big, fight hard. She needs some boxing gloves to get rocky. <laughs> These are some of her um, buttons. The word persist she's using a lot, which is, uh, again, it's not a word that really evokes, uh, for me, a lot of emotion or it doesn't, I don't want to persist. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not inspiring. Yeah. No, that's when she stood up yeah. to the 
McConnell, yeah. and she mm -hmm. said like she kept pers or yeah. she yeah. persisted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But but you know if you know if you know the backstory, you know yeah. this. But if I don't just to wear a button that says persist, persist, persist. It's not. <laughs> it sounds annoying. It's not. You, 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 okay, you're all in. You wear that purple. I like the rainbow. Her sister's possibly. She's got some. Which is also kind of a little bit of that, that matronly school teacher thing she gets criticized of. Like, persist, but persist responsibly. <laughs> She's the only one who has these glasses or things that could have alcohol that actually have a message on them about how you use them. But what, it, it, for those of you who are tracking her, what, what images is she evoking, or what, what in the imagination is she evoking? Persistence. Mm -hmm. Perseverance. 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 Fighting. Toughness. Toughness. Energy. Certainly energy. Be yourself. The idea of the, um, you know, the selfie lines that she has, so she, she will, after every rally, she will wait until the last person is gone and take selfies with them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes four hours go by, and she's still taking selfies. That's a very symbolic image of being there. And she says, she was asked, you know, why, why would you wait for four hours? And she said, well, there's someone waiting for me for four hours. And yes. it's, it's like I'm with the grassroots. If they're going to wait four hours, I'm going to wait four hours. Mm -hmm. It's really, that, that, I think that's, a, that's, that's evocative. Well, and Trump puts women down so much for being persistent, for being ourselves, for being feminine. Mm -hmm. And I think she is bringing that to light. Yeah. That, that is that we are women and we are feminine and we are pretty damn wonderful. Yeah. Well, but responsible. It's interesting, <laughs> like, she, she enacts, literally enacts, the, what we're talking about being inspiring and various mm -hmm. other things. But her, her campaign, she then re returns to, like, like more of a, a thought mind. The cerebral. The cerebral. Right. Right. You know, I wonder how much of that is, like, a trained response of being a woman in politics or woman in Right. I think it's really interesting. I've been thinking about this, and it's not in this presentation, but I've been thinking about the use of story. Because one of the things that it's a trope now that presidential candidates will say, here's a story of this person and what this person went through. And, you know, when the presidents go give their State of the Union, they plant people in the audience and they tell their stories. And there's something in the psyche that appreciates story and that likes story. But the stories are particular. And there's a way that I'm thinking that these candidates need to speak more universally and more. Like, the stories are not necessarily archetypal in themselves. Um, and she does a lot of storytelling about different kinds of people and what they're going through. But I think there's a way to kind of elevate that conversation even more to get into larger archetypal universal themes. I think well, it's respect, too, because persist responsibly to me. The reason why I dislike politics in the past so much is because it's not the truth. It's all a bunch of falsehoods, and they're trying to like, yeah. pick each other, and it's not a universal truth by any means. So yeah. persist responsibly means she's going to persist, persevere, go through. Yeah. He can't go under, over, or like slap someone in the face about it. You have to go through it, and responsibly means respectfully. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> it's interesting me looking at the products that they chose because and not just the, the taglines and the mm -hmm. logos and whatnot, but there's a like we are in big data, and something told them that their audience they're trying to reach likes this product and will buy it and will be attracted to it. So there's there's this whole, it, it's curious that this is a, it could be anything, it's, it's probably targeted towards, you know, beer drinking college students, I guess, you know, and the, like what what is the popular product that's selling the hat? Yeah, the well they, they almost all have the same products when you look at it across the board. There's very little deviation from the buttons and the stickers and the sweatshirts and the hats and the onesies for the little kids and the glasses, glassware. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty clear, but it's interesting what they put on. The tote bag is really big. It's interesting what they put on there. She's got this one, it's time to level the playing field. And she actually has the most diverse merchandise on her site of anyone that I saw, and more kind of creative imagery like this. I'm not sure level the playing field, like how evocative that is as well, but it's a, another slogan. And this slogan, two cents for ultra millionaire tax that she talks about all the time, taking two cents from every millionaire, uh, every dollar of millionaire will change the entire world. And so these are these are her. This image may may be more because we've got you know Lincoln on here, so we've got some evocative symbolism inside of this two cents. Yeah. 
you were going to say. Well, just I was going to you know, responding to him, but uh, her, her Instagram feed is all there's many shots of her dog. Uh, her, and that dog greeting her and the dog running and you know and I'm sure that's a way to connect. Yeah. That's, that's always just so funny because Trump is like the only president for forever who hasn't had a dog. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't trust anyone that doesn't have a dog. Like you have to get a dog when you get to the White House. It's what you do. And the fact that he's resisted getting a dog says a lot for us dog lovers, right? <laughs> so, uh-huh. To me, that's very disturbing and, and uh, when I see all the, the candidates because when you look at uh, even Trump, he's anti-charismatic, but he's anti-charismatic. There's an anti-charisma about him. And when I see Obama and when I see King, the charisma that they portrayed mm-hmm. and then the force, I don't see nowadays any of the candidates. And it, to me, it was very uh, disturbing and disheartening when I heard that Trump said, the only one that can probably defeat me would be Joe Biden. Almost like felt to me that he was tapping into some of that, some of this, nobody's got the charisma enough to defeat me. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the figures from the past, even young, I mean, there's something about some some of those figures about the charisma and the power to deliver the message that I don't see about her at all. None of that. And I don't see about a lot of the candidates. And not only enough, the only one that I saw was Joe Biden. So when I heard Trump saying that, it scared me because it's like he's stepping into something. Just like when he was candidate and he went to rural America like she was talking about, and he kept saying, you, they don't know that you are the ones, and you, and he kept saying that, and I'm like, what is he talking about? And Hillary even said she regretted not going to a lot of the rural areas. So I, I think a lot of times we have to look about what Trumps can see from the other side, that a lot of times the other side doesn't see themselves. And to me, that, that's, that's very, very disturbing. Hmm. So when I see that, I'm like, mm, I... No, I, so I, I, I would just disagree. I do think she has charisma mm-hmm. and energy. And she does a lot of extroverted feelings, so I would say that. Now, whether or not that's going to carry the day or not. Um, but she, she brings a vitality and a liveness in that some of the other candidates don't. That's the only place I would disagree. Someone has to match. Trump does have charisma. He has a charisma that most people that are progressive and liberal don't understand. I, I grew up. Well, I like that idea of anti charisma. <laughs> it is like an anti charisma. I, I grew up in a. I grew up in Flint, Michigan, and his type of, I don't, I don't like him at all, but his charisma mass appeals to the working class mm-hmm. and to people with more conservative values. Uh, it's, he, he, he appeals to narcissists, he appeals to the, the Wolf of Wall Street types that are out there and the hustlers and the hucksters. And if we don't understand what that psychology is, Nobody can stand up against that, mm-hmm. and 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 it feels to me that he knows that about himself. Yeah, because when he speaks, and like that's what I'm going to say about the Joe Biden, he knows that about himself, which just scares me because I can see that he's he he can see from the other side, and I wish from the other side, from the light, so to speak, we could also see how darkness works, including how anti charisma works. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Let's get to Biden. Oh, this is her hat. Hmm. That's Biden. <laughs> Similar graphics. <laughs> we choose science fiction. We choose science over fiction. That's kind of a fun one. We choose unity over division. We choose hope over fear. So there's some of that, you know, transcendence that's trying to get to there. Truth over lies. But he's making a division in that. <laughs> like, yes, he's name. Well, he's naming the division. And right. saying we're going to rise above the. Di- but instead of the, yeah. like, the other, you know, um, yeah. the other people who are attached to here, it's like instead of being like, oh, there's this lie or this lie, and hope is the unification. Uh-huh. Like, he's dividing hope and lies. Yes. So it can yeah. be a unification. Yeah, you are the party of lies, we are the party of yeah. truth, right? This is a very popular design on his merchandise the aviator glasses. Oh. This reminds me of the, the I think of it. It's the California logo, like uh, <laughs> like the, the the life is good logo. Uh, yeah. I don't quite understand it. Does anyone can explain the aviator thing? He's cool. He's where those. He's, he's oh, he's cool. Okay. Okay. All right. He's cool. This is all. Hey. 
know, did you see the, the video? It <laughs> reminds me of the video where Obama left office. They played it for the correspondence dinner, and it's, it was hilarious. It was. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. Giving him eyeglasses. Got it, got it, okay. He went to the movies with the former speaker that always cries. It was, it was, Okay. So okay. So the fact that I didn't bring that didn't call any of that up for me, and I watch politics all the time, is is troubling as a logo. <laughs> yeah. Obama had that Top Gun thing going on. Yeah. The buddies. There's his hat. Let me buzz through some of these. So I know we're getting Cory Booker. This is a mug. Sleep and I broke up again tonight. I'm finding comfort with my new special friend, Coffee. She is hot. That's campaign merchandise. This is all millennial stuff. This is millennial taglines. I I I recognize this. The colors in the other one are are millennial colors, too. Yeah. I mean, I get it, but... This is on his website, this We Rise shirt, but there's no Cory Booker on there. Just We Rise. Bernie... But as a symbol, feel the burn. Does he talk about the burn as in B U R N? Does he? Yeah. Okay. Um, Medicare for all, college for all, college for all, Medicare for all, jobs for all, justice for all. Here's a unity candidate. All together now. Not me, Not me us. Right. Although it's interesting that his other campaign stuff says feel the burn, which is very much about him. So. But this is the, the one that I'm seeing the most unity and uh, the least divisiveness in this in his material and some real diversity in, in his merch, his hat. We haven't seen any faces. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Some of them choose to go by first name. Some go by last name. So it's Corey. It's Bernie. Bernie's got his hair glasses thing. Amy Klobuchar mm-hmm. working on the green here, mm-hmm. unlike any other candidate, really. She's got uh, Amy for America, Equality for All, Amy for America. Kamala Harris. This is a poster you can buy on her site for the people. Kind of echoes Obama's old poster. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 It also echoes the shape of her poster. Well, it, it explains the Saturday Night Live uh, flick that they did on her because the actress did this exact same look oh, yeah. over again on the Saturday Night Live mm-hmm. part last week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is the prosecutor, I think, she's trying to play on the, the fact that she's a prosecutor for the people. Um, and then she's also got For the Culture, which is, there's a whole tab on her website about historically black. And so she's, she's, she's also narrowing down in that sense into a specific cultural group. And then uh, playing on the idea of fearless. It goes back kind of by evoking, right? That's another emotional... Trying to evoke something there, going back to the Elizabeth Warren as well, right? See this. So this rainbow font that's in a lot of the candidates that would not appeal in Flint. No. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. This is this is younger. This is we're the hip multicultural. Yeah. This is all. And this is pre, you know pre-nomination. So we, we can yeah. look to see once someone gets the nomination what they're going to do then, because I find most of this really uninspiring. Yeah. But it, it, it may become more inspiring once they capture the nomination. So I just pulled the hats out for you to see. And, you know, contrast that with Trump's red, make America great again, right? Where a literal slogan, an image, a fantasy, an archetype is on the hat. And here we just have names. Charisma urban slick. That's what I'm talking about, the, the anti-charisma, where I think it's much more powerful. So far. Right. Well, you and here you're aligning yourself if you wear the hat with a person, yeah. not necessarily an idea or an or the imagination, right? With one exception of the hats, we have Poot, Pete, yeah, Pete. Buttigieg's hats, <laughs> Mayor Pete, and I don't quite understand "win the era" as a slogan, but I know it's appealing to the to younger people since he's the youngest candidate. But he was the only one I could really find with a slogan on a hat. This is a T-shirt of his. Uh, yeah. It's the worst. 
the worst t shirt. I don't know who did that. Be like Pete. It's a cute creature. It's adorable. But does it evoke anything other than a little kid shirt? This is an adult shirt. Yeah, he's seen as the young candidate, and this doesn't help. I don't think that's. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of he also has a shirt I didn't pull up that says, uh, names him, his husband, and their two dogs on there. So that's another dog evocation. The Pete's got heart. Again, uh, a but about Pete, not about the country or the image of what he's going to do, right? And this is another shirt of his, respect, belonging, truth, teamwork, boldness, responsibility, substance, discipline, excellence, joy. Fresh start for America. So that's what I found in my in trying to figure out a shorthand way to present to you these candidates and, and how they're working with these ideas of archetype, image, symbol, extroverted feeling, the unconscious. It's not particularly inspiring at this moment. How about restart America? Oh, fresh. Restart. restart. 2.0. <laughs> America 2.0. <laughs> no, 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 no. Right. Yeah. So we're, we're at 4 o'clock exactly. Any, anyone move for one last comment maybe as we wrap up our time together? This is one of these more will be revealed. So I just wanted to bring this to you now so you can start watching for this. And as you watch the debates, look to see who's carrying that extroverted feeling function. Um, look to see who's inspiring, who's getting the clap lines, who's starting. You know, Kamala Harris has a, a thing I think she's doing well where she talks about the issues that keep you up at 3 in the morning. She talks about that. That's, that's a, that one gets to a little bit of feeling. Um, so we'll kind of look for those things and, and see who rises. What's that? And I was the girl on the bus. I was the girl on the bus. Right, right. right. In that debate, she pulled out a really evocative image there. Right. Um, thank you so much. It was really fun putting this together. You've been a great audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org. Thank you to our 2019 supporter-level donors, Bill Alexi, Usha and Ashok Beatty, Circle Center Yoga, Arlo and Rena Kampan, Eric Cooper and Judith Cooper, Lorna Crowell, D. Scott Dayton, George J. Didier, The Cole Family Foundation, Ramakrishnan and Full Bloom Lotus, Suzanne G. Rosenthal, Deborah Stutzman, Deborah Tobin, Alexander Wayne and Lynn Kopp, and Gerald Weiner. If you would like to support this podcast, just go to youngchicago.org slash give.